Good morning. I apologize. I am not the mouse, and I will not be speaking for the mouse. Um, I hope that person is still here. Um, he's, he is, in fact, there. So, good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on. I'm really not going to be able to speak with that level of participation. Good morning. Good morning. Much better. Okay, so hi, my name is David Blank Edelman. I am the technical evangelist at a company called AppSera, and I am here to talk to you about scaling and trust and that sort of good stuff like that. Um, this, I think, is my eighth talk at Lisa, so it's, it's thrilling to be back on stage again in front of you folks. Um, this is going to be a little bit different than my usual talks. The talks that I usually give are how to bring something from way left field into system administration to improve it. This particular time, I'm going to try to talk to you about taking a particular concept and bringing it to system administration, and I'm going to either make your conference or I'm going to ruin it um, by, by telling you about this thing that I think will be useful to you. So if you're cool with that, we'll, we'll move forward. Yes, everybody cool? With that, with that, that, okay, that's the, that's the chance. Okay, so the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to actually cut to the chase. I'm going to go right to the end and give you a, a fundamental idea, and then I will give you the tool to that idea. So here's the deal. In my opinion, production environments are all about trust. And by trust, I mean things like, you know, I've got this thing called a workload. What does it contain? What is this thing that I'm running, you know, doing? Um, where, do, where is it running? Where is the thing that I'm running? And I'm using workload as sort of a generic term. Feel free to sub in anything that you like. Uh, container, uh, virtual machine, Raspberry Pi, I don't really care what. Um, but I'm using this generic term. And here's the key thing. The question that you're always asking, or you should always be asking in a production environment is, are the right resources in play? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? And did, is it being run? Um, and is it authorized? Is the right person running it? You know, are, are the right resources running in play? So it turns out that um, in addition to that, you probably also, in the, everybody in this room knows that you have to make sure that, that the information is being passed along securely. And we have to care about all this stuff when it comes to production environments. Now, here's the problem, as everybody knows, at the Large Installation System Administration Conference, or at least that's the previous, what the previous acronym meant, is that the bigger your deploy is, the harder it is to sort of maintain that all this stuff is true. And when I say bigger, I don't necessarily mean that you have to be like web scale and have you know, 14 data centers geolocated you know, geo around the globe. It can just be this situation where you, you're starting with 10 machines and you're going to 20. Or you're starting with 10 things you have to pay attention to, and now you're up to 50. So any of this sort of stuff applies to you, independent of the size of your organization. We're just talking about the fact that it gets harder and harder as you try to put stuff out into production. Um, and if you want to do it for extra, extra special credit, if you want to have a really fun time, try doing it in multiple clouds. Right? If you start working and you start to try to deploy stuff into environments that you don't run, but then you, or two environments that you don't run, a, you know, AWS, GCE, Azure, it doesn't matter what, it gets really hard. So what I'm going to do is try to give you my best technique and tool for being able to do this, to maintain trust in these situations. Now, the problem is, is that this particular technique has the potential to maybe put you to sleep, or at least you're going to think, because that's what's associated with what I'm about to tell you, is what you usually think about in these particular cases, is it has that potential. And so if I successfully put you to sleep after the second session of Lisa, then I'm either doing my job or not. I can't tell which. But, I, but if you're cool with it, is everybody in this room cool with the pot that I might say something that has, the, has potential uh, anti-insomniac uh, things? Yes? Yes, good with that? Okay, so the one word that I'm going to give you, the really small thing I'm going to talk about, is policy. Okay, and it's a small word, and I'm told I'm not supposed to use, you know, you're not supposed to use small words on slides, so here, is that better? Um, <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about policy. Now, the problem with policy, when I say that, is the first thing that pops into people's minds are awesome things like the CBP Security Policy and Procedures Handbook, because we all love them. Um, or if you want to really stay up uh, late at night with, with, a, with a riveting thing, you could read like the handbook of fiscal policy, right? This is the things we think about when we think about policy. Or the employee manual, which we've all read, and uh, I don't know about you, but I wanted to make it in the employee manual previously that I w was at, I really wanted to make into like a Gilbert and Sullivan play. You know, it was that good. So the thing is, is but when you think of this stuff, right, you, basically you find yourself in these meetings, right? <laughs> We look like this. Or more likely, if you've actually had to sit in a policy meeting for your organization, it looks a little bit like this, right? So 
I want to suggest to you that policy in general is a lot sexier. In fact, here, let me prove it to you. Doesn't that look sexier? Okay, wait a second. So this is our latest marketing, slot, marketing picture for, for policy, and I'm getting some sense that you are not believing that this is indeed sexy, so let's fix that. Okay, now isn't it much sexier? Right? Can you agree with me that, 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 that policy is much sexier now? Because here's the thing, and I'll give you why I think that policy is actually so sexy, and it's going to look a little bit like a car commercial for a moment, so you'll just excuse me. Um, Policy can be sexy because if you do it right, here, actually, let's just, your environment probably looks more like that. Or maybe, maybe actually your environment looks more like that. Or actually, let's get, let's get just real here. Policy is, you know, policy or your environment looks, it probably actually is more like sort of a go-kart situation. <laughs> Right, okay, so I just want to say this is the real thing, but here's the thing you might have noticed or you might not have noticed about all those pictures. What they all have in common is they have these guardrail thingies, right? So these are barriers that are there. They have these guardrail thingies. In fact, there are two companies I found out that make that kind for go-karts, in case you're curious if you want to buy one. But the notion is, is if you can use policy to set up these guardrails where you are basically saying, hey, here's what's allowed. You can actually turn me down because I can hear myself echoing. I was, I was totally fine. If you want push the level down a little bit, that'd be good. Um, so you can, um, if you set up these guardrails, then you can set things up so you in the operations group, or whatever you call yourself, can set up these, uh, come, on, come on in by the way, you, you can um, set up these guardrails where you say, here's what's allowable in my environment, here's what people can do, the operations group set this up, and then the people that use it, the users, the developers, whatever you want to call them, can just do whatever they want, as long as they're working within these guardrails, right? they can just get um, their work done. And they don't have to bother you. You don't have to do what, what Tom Limicelli calls transactional system administration, where you have a situation where every time I need a VM, I'm going to ask somebody for it. I was just at a conference where Target was speaking, and they were saying, in order for, prior to recent, recent time, when, they, when their, their recent changes, if somebody wanted a virtual machine to be able to do something on, it would mean that 10 separate groups at Target would have to touch that request, which means it would take six months to get a single VM, and that's just ludicrous, right? It's, it's ludicrous that you should be able to set things up so that people can do what people do well, and here, let me, here's another picture. So you can do something where people can do, you know, there's a distinction here. One of them is a person, one of them is a robot, and, and I know it falls down because there's a person in a robot suit, so just, just roll with it, okay? Um, <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is, is that in this particular case is if you can use something like policy, then you can make it so that the machines can do what they do really well. They can enforce this sort of stuff. And people can say, hey, here's what I want, here's what I expect, and then they can just go. So this is my fundamental premise. My fundamental premise is, is that you should make, set things up using policy, if you can, to make sure that people are doing what they should be doing and that the Machines are doing what they should be doing. And if you don't, and this is where I believe you should get out there with the pitchforks and the torches and riot um, about this sort of stuff, right? If your environment is set up so that you have to do stuff that machines can do, rather than setting up a policy and letting people just go, then, you're, then you, should, you should be angry at whatever that. Now, just out of curiosity, because I know this crowd, does anybody know where this still is from? It, yeah, look at that. I love this crowd. You're absolutely right. This is indeed from Young Frankenstein. Good for you. This is great. I knew that was going to work. Okay, so what are the kinds of things that you, we get into trouble with with people? You know, like who, where, where you have um, people that go off without a lack of policy, right? You get these awesome situations like, hey, you know, you have a developer who says, hey, it's 2 a.m. and I'm sure more memory will make it work better. Just lots more. Let's, 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 let's use lots more. Or, hey, I wanted to spin up my Docker image and away it went. What do you mean it had some sort of malware in it? Right? And in fact, the last time I looked at the, at the Docker registry, the MySQL container, not the, I think it's the official one, had some awesome CVEs in it. And guess what? You get to spin that out to production. Doesn't that sound great? Aren't you excited by that? Or, hey, I've got some container out there, or VM, or whatever you want to call it, and it's doing what? It shouldn't be talking to anybody. I don't understand why it's got you know, high, you know, 100 megs of bandwidth. What, what the hell's going on here? Or, hey, you know, in fact, this was talked about uh, by Mikey. You know, the newest open, access, open SSL exploit is out. You know, heart, shaved, heart bleed, puppy, uh, friendly guy. You know, and now I have to worry about it. Are we vulnerable to it? Right? These are all things that you don't know because, the machine, because you don't have this stuff in place. Or people come to you and say, hey, what version of Java were we running? Really? We're running something that's old? Or really, really, we've already moved to the new one? I had no idea. 
So, um, or, you know, this is a simple one, right? What about the data various credentials? Who has them? What can they do? Who knows? So, what I have found when I've talked to people about this sort of stuff is that most of the time people find that they have policy in their environment in two different ways. Right? So some people have the equivalent of a customs desk where there's a person sitting there and that person's job is to look mean and to say no or to really question you. What do you mean you need that VM? What's that for? What, do you, you know, what are you going to do that for? And that you have to go to somebody explicitly with this mother may I situation saying, please can I have this thing? And their job is to, is to, is to thoroughly vet. The plus about doing this way is chances are the risk to your organization is small because there's professionals out there vetting your requests. That's really cool. The minus is there probably there aren't the same number of professionals as there are requests. So you get these really long queues and so it takes forever. And that's not so great. Now, the alternative that you tend to find, and especially because now that I work for a company that is in San Francisco and I've seen the Silicon Valley world, is the other choice you have is you get the wild, wild west. Okay, and the wild, wild west looks something like this. Everybody with a credit card can get whatever resources they need. Or, yeah, we have policies, they're just spread out around. Some of the policies about what you should be doing are in the wiki over here. Some of them are, some of them are in this person, you know, employee number two's brain over here. And, you know, in your best of cases, maybe the policy stuff is embedded in your tooling. Maybe it's in your Puppet or Chef configs or your Ansible or something. Or maybe it's in, you know, your CI and C stuff. So you're, if someone's actually written it down in some form. But it's usually spread out everywhere. And that's really not great, because in the Wild Wild West, I don't know how many people watch Wild Wild West films, but invariably, somebody catches a stray bullet in that situation, right? Um, and, you know, in the Wild Wild West, you'd have, like, mine shafts fall because they didn't, they, someone didn't make, the, didn't make the mine using the right standards, or, you know, uh, the, the whole town washes out because it's built in the wrong place, or in your environment, somebody gets hold of the wrong database password and you're screwed, or, you know, and you show up in the news, or all stuff like that. So this is the problem with the Wild Wild West. And then even then, it's not uncommon for you to get these mixtures where you have this situation, and I know I've been in situations where um, there is an official policy body or policy organization, and you're supposed to go to them, and somebody says, I can't stand doing it this way anymore. I'm going to go off and run my own IT infrastructure. Right? And so what you get over there is you get this awesome shadow IT thing. And guess what the shadow IT thing looks like? It looks a lot like the wild, wild west. So you get the best of both things going on. My assertion is that there is something better, that you can do something better. So, for example, so what would be better? My opinion about what you can do is you can make sure that your policy is first off pervasive. It shows up everywhere in your environment, that there's some way that you are able to specify and think about policy in everything you do, and it touches everything so you can set that up. And this is um, important because you want to be able to be explicit. You want to be able to say explicitly what is allowed and what's not allowed. Not vague things like bad people shouldn't do bad things. You know, you want to be able to say things that, in a more explicit way. And here's the thing that I don't have to tell this crowd, but you would be surprised. If you have a policy system that isn't automatically enforced, you know, a manual policy situation, it's like, it's, it's almost worse than no policy at all in some ways, right? So you want the machines to do what machines do well. So this is my premise so far. I want to check in and make sure that, that it is both understood and if there is lots of or mostly agreement in the room, that's really good because now if you agree with me that this is indeed something you should be thinking about, then what I would like to do is spend a little bit of time talking about the places that you may or may not have thought about that you might want to govern, if you, for a better, lack of a better word. Okay? Can I get a, a yay or nay? Yes, we agree? No? We? Yes, okay, some nodding. Okay, good. This is good. And those people that are indeed still skeptics, hang on and let me see if I can convince you. Now, one thing I will say is I'm going to give you some of my answers here, but then I'm going to ask you to help me make this presentation even cooler by giving me some of your answers. So let's talk about enforcement points. So in the realm of policy, the standard thing that you see everywhere, which is reasonable, is you have some sort of resource limits. You want to be able to say, this person or this project or this application can consume this amount of CPU, can have this much of memory associated with it, disk space, network usage we talked about. Um, sometimes you want to be able to say, hey, every VM or every container, it can be only this big. Or sometimes you want to say, in an aggregate, hey, I want to be able to say that all of my containers take up only this amount of space, 
that sort of stuff, right? So this is pretty normal. And then sometimes you have things like object counts, which shows up in Kubernetes, which we'll talk about later. Um, you you want to be able to say, hey, only 14 VMs, or you, you get 30 VMs, okay? So that's the basic stuff. And lots of, you know, it, that's, where, that's what you would think about when you first think about policy and quote, you think about these sort of quotas sort of things. Um, but really, you also have to think a little bit about if you're, if you're doing it smart and you're building a really, you know, a reasonable system that's going to scale, you have to think about what about the connections between one workload and another. Let's call it container A and container B. Okay, so it's important, and this is something that people don't always get right, is to make sure that you can, at a granular level, say per port and even per protocol, who can, what can go between these two things. Because what tends to happen is what often people do is they, they just set up a system where there's an ACL that says A can talk to B, and therefore B can talk to A. And when you have a situation where you have this bi-directional trust that you've set up, you're setting yourself up for not the greatest security posture. Because let's assume the container B gets owned by something, by some nasty, you know, uh, no good nick. If B gets owned, it means that B can now attack A. It has the ability to talk, you know, anything, you know, it, it has a clear path to attack A as much as it likes, okay? So it makes more sense to be able to uh, state that I can only get from my application to my database server, the only thing that can happen is it can talk on the database port on TCP over there, and that's all it can do. Because then if B gets popped, it's not going to be able to hack A, and that's, that's important, okay? So um, now, in addition to that, you want to think about what can come into your system and what can leave the system. I talked about before the situation where somebody says, hey, where's all this traffic coming out of this container? I have no idea what's going on with that. You want to be able to legislate that. You want to be able to say, no, 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 this has no egress at all. Or what can come into that? Okay? And um, you also want to think about, especially in a multi-cloud situation, how do I say this application can be found through this URL? And so I'm going to associate this application with this, work, with, this, with this workload. Now, the importance of being able to do this in policy is if you start doing multi-cloud stuff, you want to make sure that when you're running this application, now you're running it in AWS and tomorrow you move it over to GCE or Azure, you want to make sure that that URL doesn't change. It should just continue to point the right place. So you want to have something automatically doing this for you. And like I said, multi-cloud stuff can be fun. Okay, now here's where we get even more interesting. And really, I only have a couple more of these, of these slides to, to get you thinking before I start to ask you a question. So if you aren't already thinking about this stuff, and I haven't already started to, to get the cranium you know, cranked into gear about what sort of policies you would really like to see in your environment, then I'm just warning you we're getting there. So a thing that you really also want to be able to do is reason about the software components that you're using. You want to be able to say you can use if somebody says to me, hey, I want to use Java, you say, fine, the default for Java in our environment is 1.7 or 1.8 or whatever it is. I'm making, making numbers up here. Um, you also want to be, be able to say things like, hey, um, from now on, we are only going to allow this version. And so what will happen is you retire the old version, and um, it is the case that um, anything that is still running the old version can continue running, but you can't launch anything else with the new version. You want to be able to say stuff like that. And the reason why stuff like that becomes important is when you're dealing with things like Heartbleed and other stuff like that. You really want to say, hey, um, I have this policy that says I'm no longer going to put 1.0F into, into production, so tell me, you know, make sure that I no longer can push out something with a Heartbleed vulnerability, and then tell me what's out of compliance right now. Because um, the people in this room are the people that know just how fun it was to have to go audit n, you know, n hundred applications to figure out which things were indeed out of, were, 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 you know, were heart, heart bleed problematic. Right? And so what I'm suggesting to you is, is that if you have a system that can understand your dependencies, it can understand your, 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 your essential software that you put out there, then you can win. You, know, you, can, you can really win. So I would suggest that that's important. Similarly, for those of us who actually do sort of deployment stuff, and I suspect many people in this room do, right? Could, do anybody here in, in the room, let's, let's ask it the positive way. People in the room here who believe that they do something that has the word deployment in it, put stuff out? Yes, right, so almost all of the room, right? So when you do deployment, you want to be able to say, hey, here are the things that I think have to be true. Here are the stages that I have to go through to deploy something. I want to make sure it goes through this check, this check, and this check before it actually gets to production. So it's really great to be able to say stuff like, hey, I want to put a malware checker right in the middle of my deployment process so I never, ever, ever put a Docker container out there that has malware in it. And if your software will do that for you, 
then this is, the, this is great. And if your software isn't doing that for you right now, I'm telling you to go back now and start, or actually start typing is what I suggest, you know, to get this, to get this thing going. Because you really want to have something like that. You want to be able to control it. You may, wanna, you may have other different ideas about what must be true about your software before it gets deployed. So I want to suggest this is great. Okay, last slide about things that I think about for enforcement points. One of the things that gets really hard, and the people in this room know this better than others, is that you have this really great thing where people are trying to develop software, and in order to develop software, they have to get at some log information on maybe, like, say, the server that they're talking to with their software. Like, let's say you're writing something that's got database stuff, and then you want to go find out what the transactions look like on the server. Well, I may not want random developer, he or she, to go off and get on my, on my SQL server. But I am okay with them getting the log, so you want to have something that facilitates their ability to get the logging information that they need, right, without access to the whole uh, kit and caboodle. And this is going to sound a little meta, but you probably have thought of this before. Um, if you're going to have a policy system, who can change policy? Who can read it? Who can write it? And if you don't have that in there, then it's almost, you know, it's not so great. Okay, and I'm going to tell you something that's sort of like from the future because I thought it was horribly cool. It's something that, that the thing that we make does that I have never seen anywhere and I would love other people to, 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 to see what the potential is and see what we can do with it. One of the things that we can do is um, if let's say you have two containers or two workloads, one of them is an application, one of them is a, is a MySQL database, we can stick something in the middle, something in line where um, your application will talk to this thing in the middle and it actually talks to the database server. And what this gets you, among other things, is you can do cool th stuff. Like, for example, you can set it up so the thing in the middle holds the real database credentials, but the application has this ephemeral set of credentials that are only true during the time that they're hooked up. And the beauty of that is, is that if somebody happens to pop your server or you happen, to, some developer likes to put their credentials into their source code, the credentials that, that are available to them have nothing to do with what's, what's really on the server. So it's, just, so it's a much more secure thing. Or if you want to have even more fun, because we can understand the wire protocol that goes across between an application and a MySQL server, and I want to just say, if in fact you would like to look at the MySQL on the wire protocol, um, God save your soul, because um, you're, you're in for some hell. Um, um, but if you can do that, you can do awesome stuff. Like you can say, hey, the thing in the middle can say, I will not allow any drop statements to happen on my database. Right? So if you're thinking in the middle, so, so if something goes wrong with that, with, with, that, with that application, it's fine. They can send as many drop statements as they want, and, the, thi and you know, the thing in the middle will just drop them on the floor. And so this is beautiful. Or maybe you want to introduce some artificial latency into this situation. Right? You want to do something like um, Netflix's latency monkey stuff. Okay? Where well, you want to see, well, what does the application do if there's, la if there's latency between me and the database? You can do that. Or um, there, there's lots of stuff. Maybe you want a circuit breaker. Maybe too many transactions should make it all stop. So you can make sure that your applications are not hammering your database servers. It's beautiful. There's lots of cool stuff that you can do if you use this concept. And so I'm telling you about it because I think that we could, we could do some more stuff. But the notion here is, is that you can apply policy even at the level of what transactions are allowed between your applications and your database if you do it the right way. Okay, so I have just given you my ideas for policy sort of stuff. What did I leave out that you would like to see um, in terms of policy that you would like to state in your environment that you cannot do now or maybe you can do now? What else? I think people are even thinking. We'll have another 30 seconds of awkward silence. Michael? Okay, so you want so you want to be able so you want to be able to say things about affinity, what can live where. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What else? I saw another hand up. What's your exception policy if they can't follow the regular policy? Oh, that's awesome. I hadn't thought about that. That's awesome. Okay, exception policies. Yep. Yep. Any more? Room on my slide. Yes, please. How do, you, how do you adjust policies? Like, what's the, what policies are changing policies? Awesome. Oh, more. More. One more. Okay, I'll take one more. 
And that's the, and then we'll go on. Yep. Yeah, you want to talk about compliance, absolutely. Awesome. So anyway, these are some cool things that, that we now do. Yes, oh, sir, go ahead. How do you clean policy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I totally agree with that. Nice, very nice. Okay, so... The next question you might ask, see, these are awesome things that I think that policy should have. Um, this is the nice thing about coming to this conference. People write your slides for you. It's really awesome. Um, <laughs> so here's the next question you're going to ask me. Where, in fact, can I find something like this? Like, where, where, like, like is, does there exist out there stuff that would indeed help me apply this sort of policy and do this? And so I'm here to give you the answer to that question. Um, unfortunately, the bad news is you're not going to be able to get this from your cloud provider. The closest people that come, the people that come perhaps closest to it might be, like as per usual, they're a little ahead uh, in the cloud world, Amazon, which gives you the ability to do EC2 instances, uh, stat, you know, you can say who can get what instances, or network topologies, or some firewall stuff, um, but that's as far as you get. You don't get anything near what we just talked about together. Um, if you're using Azure, last I looked, it has a role-based access control thing where there are three set roles. You can't make any more roles. You get these three roles, and you better like them, you know, Henry Ford style. Um, so uh, not so much. Um, the Google Compute Engine, and I hope there's a GCE person here, because the last time I looked at this, I'm pulling this right off their, 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 their documentation. It says, if team members have edit permissions and they can modify instances and also access the instances through SSH, if team members are authorized as owner, then they're able to create Google Compute Engine resources in the project. Whoopee. You know, it's kind of binary. And if, in fact, you deal with my friends at SoftLayer, IBM SoftLayer, what you will find is that the best thing that they have for policy is that you are able to... Um, click on stuff in their GUI when you're provisioning resources. And they have many, many, many possible checkboxes. Check Last time I counted, it was somewhere around 70. Um, they're not all about, they're not, most of them are, vast majority, I'm not policy related, but I just want to say that, oh, so many checkboxes. But not the ones you want, in my experience. Okay, so another choice would be, well, maybe you're running on something that's, that's like one level up from just infrastructure. Maybe you're using some sort of platform -y thing out there to do container management. So an awesome container management package or, or compute fabric, I guess is what I would call them, is Mesos, right? Now, the problem is, is as far as I can tell, Mesos does not at the moment have any sort of stuff in the policy realm that we're talking about. They have authentication. They, have, they say, hey, your frameworks can do can do policy sort of things if they want to, but I haven't seen it out there. And I really want somebody to tell me it's wrong because Mesos could be awesome, but it doesn't have any of this stuff, okay? Um, so the next one that you hear here at least a lot is OpenStack. And OpenStack, I'm gonna say not yet. OpenStack is doing some really interesting stuff. They have a project called Congress, which is meant to be a policy engine sort of thing that other components will talk to. At the moment, last I looked at the code, it could, do react, it could do reactive things where it could say, hey, somebody just did something bad that's against our policy. Maybe you should do something about it. Uh, say again? So it's like real Congress. Like real Congress. Yeah, that's very funny. <laughs> yeah, it's right now reactive. I think this is going to get better. They certainly have some good plans for it, but it's not there yet. Um, the other thing that I also think is awesome is Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes gets there. Uh, a little bit. It has the quotas we talked about in the beginning for like resource stuff like that, and you can set limits out there, and maybe some of the stuff around networking will be better, but it's still not out there. For example, the networking, the ability to do networking stuff isn't there. And in fact, I should say that about Mesos also. Like, I have asked um, engineers at, Me at Mesosphere, and I've talked to the CTO of Mesosphere, and said, what's the deal with, with, with the ability to have networking um, be separate from each other? Let's say I'm running two workloads, and I don't want them to talk to each other. And the answer was something along the lines of, we give you what whatever Linux provides. So we can do sort of like QoS stuff, but we don't really have that. Um, so I think you should go out there and demand it. And I'm going to make, this is going to be the most, the only salesy thing I'm going to say in my talk. The only sales thing I'm going to say in my talk is, if in fact you think the policy stuff that we've been talking about is something you want, um, the company that I work for in fact does make a platform that does this stuff. Because we've been thinking about this for three and a half years, four years, and we kind of know what we think should be there, but there's not everything that could be there. But if you're interested, come check us out. That's, that's, the, sale, that's the, the, the 10 second sales pitch. I, I promise no more than that. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do as I'm, coming, as I'm coming down to the end of my time. Um, I'm going to give you your very own pitchfork and your very own torch. 
okay? Because what I want to say is that you, the people in this room, need to be able to scale. And you need to have trust to be able to do it. And if, in fact, you don't have something like policy that can help you scale and to help you have that trust, you should demand it. You should get out there with the, your pitchforks and stuff like that. For every talk that you listen to from now on at Lisa, you should be evaluating, or every vendor you meet in the vendor booth, ask yourself, do they have something that allows me to make sure that the people do what people do well, and the machines do what machines do well, and I can set something up and let people just go? If they don't have a policy like system like that, then, then, then step on their toes and tell them they need it, right? And if you want to talk more about this sort of stuff, if you, if you agree with me, this is interesting, or you want to come argue with me, which I would love, I would love it if you came to me and said, this is what you're saying is just total, total BS, but I don't think it is, um, come talk to me afterwards. I'll be around here. And in fact, um, we are holding a boff to talk about what happens with container management systems after you say, hey, this is awesome. I haven't installed my laptop. How do I bring it to production? What are the things I'm going to run into as I try to actually run one of these real systems? You saw that list over there. Even our system. Or what about policy? What do you, you know, what do you need? Come talk to our boff. It's, it's a sponsored boff. So we will, in fact, uh, feed you, you know, you know, beer and pretzels and other stuff like that. But come talk to us. Um, and come talk amongst ourselves. Because I really want to hear the travails that people are having trying to set up these things that are, I think, going to be, you know, in your future. Okay. And with that, that, without that, I just want to say, and here, look, this looks a little marketing. I'm sorry, but this is the, the official marketing end slide. Um, I want to say, I want to thank you for listening to me. Um, I'm hoping that you will get in touch with me um, and talk, talk with me afterwards um, uh, because I really want to, this stuff is interesting to me and I hope it's interesting to you. So with that, I'm going to end and ask for any questions. I think I'm good to go for another two minutes worth of questions before we have to turn over before the next really, really awesome speaker comes on. Shannon will be will rock your world. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, I think it's actually... To the microphone, Batman. Hey, microphone. Yeah. Hello, microphone. Yeah, it's there. I yes. can hear you. Okay. Um, thing for the, the, the what did I forget? Um, usability, under like comprehensibility of the policy. Uh, this is, you touched on it a little bit with the IBM soft layer thing of like 70 checkboxes. You can have all of the policies, all of the rules, all yeah. of the EC2 IAM BS that you want, but if I'm a developer and I'm trying to get something done and I can't understand what I'm restricted from doing, I'm going to go, I'm going to find the pitchfork. And that is indeed one of the hardest parts. You were talking about how usability is key. What's one of the hardest parts when you're designing policy systems or thinking about it? And this gentleman is 100% right. If you're not thinking about that, if you're not thinking about usability, if you're not thinking about accessibility for people who can't see, say, who are colorblind, so red and, red and green aren't, uh, you know, like as discernible as you think they should be. If you're not thinking about this sort of stuff in your policy system, you really want to think. Think really hard about this because you're going to get it all wrong the first time. Take my word for it. You know, like we've been, we've been churning at this stuff, like I said, for close to four years now. And, and I think we're starting to get it right, but I know it's, uh, it's a hard spin. Any other questions before we move on to, to Shannon? I'm hoping you'll come talk to me afterwards if you don't want to talk in like big public spaces, because I think this stuff is, is awesome, and I think it can help you. Go home, go home, make use of this, do this. Um, and, you know, uh, I should also say, I'm sorry, one last thing I'll say is the last thing, is we are hiring um, uh, different positions. I'd be glad to talk to you, because I'm supposed to say that, um, and I agree with it. We are hiring, and you want to come work with us. Um, we're also taking on customers, so if you want to, you know, like, <laughs> just in case you're concerned, um, you, should, you should definitely come talk to us. And so come, come visit me, you know, around the conference, and come to our BOF, um, drink some beer, and let's Let's talk about, you know, uh, AppSera, and let's talk about Mesos, and let's talk about Kubernetes stuff. It's right after the Kubernetes buff, by the way. So I'm hoping people from the Kubernetes buff will come join us so we have a sort of a more expansive conversation. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate your time and energy.